Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream. There will be spoilers for Morbius. Can I just start this video by saying that I think this movie owes Michael Keaton fans an apology and maybe a refund? If you are going by the trailers for Morbius, a film that feels like it's been coming out since the beginning of time thanks to the COVID delays, you'd probably think that the beloved Batman and Jack Frost star was a major player in the movie, maybe teaming up with the titular Morbius and playing a big role in the film, when that couldn't be farther from the truth. He ended up being in two scenes, both of which are post-credits. And in one of them, it's probably not even him, it's just a guy in a vulture mask the entire time. If you showed up to this movie for the promise of seeing Michael Keaton reprise his role from Spider-Man Homecoming, you're barely gonna get that. Honestly, it kind of borders on false advertising. I wanted to lead with that because honestly, I really like Keaton as an actor, and his role was one of the few reasons I was interested in this project at all. But I should probably expand things out to the rest of the movie. I mean, if Morbius itself is great, a little dishonest trailer editing maybe isn't such a big deal. Sadly, Morbius is the kind of movie where you can feel the studio's nervous fingerprints all over it. Like the first Suicide Squad or the theatrical cut of Justice League, it feels like a film where anything that was once interesting or unique about it was excised from the final cut in the name of getting a generic, baseline origin story out the door. The most damning thing I can say about Morbius is it feels less like a movie and more like an ad for future installments of Morbius. Maybe this is exactly the film that the director intended to make, but I can't help but doubt it, because it's a film that just feels like large chunks of it are missing. An easy example of this is Morbius's main problem in the film. He's cured himself, but now has extreme bloodlust. Every six hours, he has to drink some artificial blood to keep the urge at bay. But there's a huge problem, because that window of time keeps shrinking, and soon he will have to face the option of drinking real human blood to stay alive, or die. That feels like pretty high stakes, right? Well, they are, until they're just not. The film spends so much time lingering on Michael Morbius timing his blood intake and writing down notes about it, only to completely abandon this concept in the third act. It's not like the movie even makes a point of saying this is still a problem. After a certain point, they just stop mentioning it at all. The most dramatic choices that the movie sets up for our lead. What will he do when he runs out of artificial blood, and will he have to destroy himself to save others? Are completely ignored in an ending that feels like it can't wait to be over and done with, so that it can get to the actually important work of promoting the next Sony Marvel movie. It's really strange, and it makes the movie feel like it's basically the result of patched together studio notes, and not something designed with any explicit purpose. And the other thing is, these post credit scenes aren't even good. There's been a lot of underwhelming comic book movie post credit scenes through the years, but this one almost plays like a parody of the concept. The first one just sees Adrian Toomes zapped into the Venomverse and immediately released from prison. The second is clearly a reshoot and covers Toomes' face when he mentions Spider-Man and says he wants to form a team. To which Morbius just replies, intriguing. Which was... Really odd, since we don't even know if Morbius knows who Spider-Man is. I guess he does, but that Spider-Man poster from the trailer isn't even in the actual film. So until this scene, no one has ever mentioned Spider-Man in this movie. It's just a really odd and forced note to end on. But what about everything else? Well, there's not many characters we're talking about. I guess Matt Smith's Milo. You know, I like Matt Smith. I enjoyed him on Doctor Who, and I hope his upcoming Game of Thrones prequel is good. But Man, he has had some terrible luck when it comes to blockbuster movie roles between this and Terminator Genesis. I will say that I think he's giving easily the most engaged performance here. He's going big and goofy in a way that kind of fits the material, but I definitely can't say that the Milo character is totally successful. We need to buy that these two are best friends, which is hard to do when most of their scenes take place after one is trying to kill the other. There's a hint of something more there. I want to give the movie credit for a setup that I think could have been interesting. Mad Men's Jared Harris plays their doctor and father figure, Dr. Nicholas, who has cared for these boys with a rare blood disorder for almost their entire lives. Morbius went on to be an acclaimed, world-renowned doctor, and Milo went on to be a... Super rich businessman, I guess? 
Did I miss something here? At one point, Bancroft mentions that he's like their main funder at this massive medical company. I don't think the movie addresses why he had so much money at any point. Anyway, there's clearly some resentment between Milo and Dr. Nicholas. Milo believes that the doctor has always cared about Morbius more. This is really only addressed in one scene, in a verbal argument between the characters before Nicholas is murdered. That was the high point of the character for me. They put two great actors in a room and just let them act. But all of that stuff is barely touched on. Milo's turn to top shelf comic book evil feels both really forced and really predictable. It was like the seeds of his motivation were planted a tiny little bit, but then he just embraces being a mass murderer so easily with zero hesitation that it kind of comes out of nowhere. I also thought it was really funny how the movie kept trying to downplay the murders that Morbius committed. Like they do this fake out at one point where they're trying to make it seem like Morbius killed the nurse. But it was really obvious he didn't do it because the cops kept noting all the mercenaries he murdered on the ship were really bad awful people who were better off dead anyway. But this nurse wasn't. The movie is basically shouting in your face, it's fine he killed all these guys, but this nice nurse lady would be a bridge too far. So of course Milo did it. I want to say the movie is predictable because every single move Milo makes definitely is, but it actually drops too many plot threads for me to say that about the movie as a whole. I already mentioned the artificial blood thing, but there's also the little girl that he puts into a coma. The first 20 minutes of the movie spends so much time with Anna, she's like a patient that has most of Morbius's attention. He has to put her into a coma and then… nothing. I mean literally she is not mentioned again. So why is this in the movie? Are audiences supposed to want to come back for Morbius 2 in like 3 years to find out what happened to this one minor character in a subplot? It's just such a baffling writing choice that I can't help but feel there must have been something more going on there that just got cut from the final film. He's so weak. I need more plasma. Then there's the good doctor himself. Look, I'll be honest, I never really cared about Morbius as a Spider-Man villain. I think he tends to be pretty dull. When I was a kid, I'd be excited to read Spidey facing off against Doc Ock, the Kingpin, Venom, Mysterio. Morbius was not making that cut. I think he's more memorable in the 90s animated show, but that's really about it. On top of that, Jared Leto is not my favorite actor. I like him in Requiem for a Dream and a few other things, but I usually find his performances really mannered, broad, and obvious. But you know what, I'll just say he's mostly fine here. Morbius is still not my idea of a great character, but I don't think the actor is doing a terrible job with what he's given. The cast just isn't really the problem here, it's the script. This screenplay is a mess, in a way that feels notable even for blockbusters, where messy scripts are often the norm. If a better cut of this movie exists, I really hope it's put out in some form, because what we have now just does not work as a narrative. At times, it feels like the blockbuster movie equivalent of those big messy video game launches, where it just kind of seems like the film was released in an unfinished state. But unlike No Man's Sky, there's no patches coming for Morbius, and the movie really needs one considering that Morbius' plan involves having to kill himself and then he just doesn't do that for no discernible reason. The action is generic, apart from that floaty smoke effect that does look kind of neat but is also really the only trick this movie has up its sleeve. And I'm sorry, but that's just not enough. Where the first Venom movie really gets by on Tom Hardy's over the top, fun, and very committed performance, Morbius just doesn't have anything you haven't seen done better elsewhere. It's a movie that feels straight out of the 2004 superhero movie playbook, but it's not even doing that well, to the point where it manages to make Ben Affleck's Daredevil look like Spider-Man 2 in comparison. I know this video is coming off as harsh, but honestly, walking out of this movie, I was just baffled by how little there was to it. The movie just feels like such an afterthought compared to the post credit scene ads, which really did bum me out. I think there has been some incredible superhero movies through the years, but Morbius is exactly the kind of film that hits everything I don't like about the genre when these things go wrong. It's sloppy, lazy, and seems like nothing more than a paycheck for almost everyone involved. I didn't think Dr. Michael Morbius could carry his own film when this was announced, and the movie itself definitely didn't convince me otherwise. 
But hey, speaking of 2000 superhero movies, why not check out my video on Ang Lee's Hulk that's only streaming on Nebula. Nebula is my streaming service that I'm on alongside creators like Nando V Movies, Patrick H. Willems, Cinema Wins, and so many more. What I love about Nebula is that it's creator driven first, so things like YouTube's algorithm, ads, and bots just aren't an issue there. Plus, it's bundled in with an amazing documentary streaming service, Curiosity Stream. This month, I've really been revisiting The History of Home, which was narrated by Parks and Rec's Nick Offerman, and which you can only see on Curiosity Stream. And when you add all those history documentaries in with the science, nature, and tech stuff, you have a great offer. So when you sign up for Curiosity Stream, you'll receive an email welcoming you to Nebula as well, getting both services for just $14.79 for the entire year. So sign up now by going to curiositystream.com slash Captain Midnight. That's curiositystream.com slash Captain Midnight. Here's a special tip for the fellows and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.